Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for the Youth Access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force. We are coming to you today on Zoom and on the FAA's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter live streams. For any reporters joining us on the live stream, please note that all discussions are for background only. A video archive of the event will be available on the FAA's social media accounts after the meeting ends. Now I will read the Federal Advisory Committee Act official statement. This meeting is being held pursuant to a notice published in the Federal Register on February the 24th, 2022. The agenda for the meeting was announced in that notice with details as set out in the agenda posted on the FAA committee website. I am the designated federal officer responsible for compliance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act under which the meeting is conducted. It is my responsibility to see to it that the agenda is adhered to and that accurate minutes are kept. I also have the responsibility to adjourn the meeting should I find it necessary to do so in the public interest. Only youth access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force members may participate in any discussions and vote on matters put to a vote by the chair. Now I will turn it over to the chair. Thank you, Angela, and good morning, everyone. So nice to see all of your smiling boxes. <laughs> and just um, I want to start with a thank you to our FAA team. Um, always do an incredible job. Thank you, Angela, Twee, Aaliyah, uh, Lindsay, Jack, and anybody else that's involved today. Um, we couldn't do this work without you, so thank you very much. So, you know, thank you, everybody. You know, we've been hard at work on this for, for quite some time, and um, I know that the work is, is so critical and important, as we've all talked about, and particularly now, as, um, as we're just seeing demand increase and and hopefully the wind down, I won't say the end of the pandemic, but the wind down of the pandemic, which is making everyone really eager to fly in and get out. Um, we also have two new members of the task force and um, I'll ask them to introduce themselves after we do the approval of the minutes and before we get into the subcommittee reports. You know, we're really creating um, a platform from which lives can be transformed and energized by the work that we're doing. And this report is really going to be a roadmap um, for how to get this work done. And I hope it's going to inspire government and industry and academia and nonprofits to partner and collaborate together. So I have um, I have British family and um, as you know, football, aka soccer to us, you know, is enormous in the UK. And I have a little six year old cousin who's um, got mad skills and um, is actually being pruned from the age of six, right? And that's just the depths of how one industry is really, you know, identifying talent, recruiting talent, and feeding that pipeline um, and staying connected to that little person all the way through to potentially a career. Um, and I know that's how we're really thinking about this, this journey that, you know, how can we get to them early and stay connected with them um, by the time they decide technical or, or college education and then getting into the industry. You know, so our recommendations are going to really resemble how you build a farm team. Um, uh, so not just for today, really for the next 20 years, right? So, you know, just a reminder to all of us as we um, start to do those draft recommendations from subcommittees is that we really want to make sure we're building our recommendations based on data. Right, what be it qualitative, quantitative, other folks' research, um, so that we can stand on the shoulders of, of, uh, of good data to help drive our decision making. So I really applaud President Biden, who just this week announced his uh, federal budget um, and includes a $2,175 increase in Pell. Right, these are the grants that go to the neediest students. It's estimated to help 6.7 million low and middle income students. Um, we know finances are one of the biggest barriers to joining our industry. So this will go quite a long way in terms of helping students um, overcome one of those significant barriers. And there is a longer term plan to double Pell by 2029. 
um, I would encourage Congress and the president to please do that a heck of a lot faster <laughs> than, you know, uh, seven years from now. Uh, but it's at least a stake in the ground and a, and a goal and a direction. Um, I also applaud the president's desire to really um, support greater support for minority serving institutions um, to expand their institutional capability. We know that um, these are excellent resources to find underserved populations, which is part of our charter and how to reach out and bring those students to our industry. Um, so I really applaud the efforts to support those um, that institutional capacity um, and uh, and reaching those those students. So as as I mentioned at our last public meeting in my 26 years in this um, being connected to this industry, I have never seen the demand for our students um, the way it is right now. Um, and I think that's only going to increase, you know, at the same time, we're seeing rural communities um, and less served communities actually not being able to have service because of the demand. Um, so we know how critical this work is, and that just makes our work harder, right? If we don't have the advantage of airplanes coming in and out of a, a more underserved community, um, you know, we don't have the allure and the attraction. And so I think that just makes our job that much harder, um, especially in terms of reaching rural populations, which we know is also an untapped potential. Um, so today we're gonna to hear from the subcommittees. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Women's Board report which just came out this week. I, I congratulate them on, on finishing that and you know, and about the structure, about what our final report would look like. Um, and I'm just really excited always to talk to all of you and, and get into the work. So let's start with the, um, the minutes. If I could get a motion to approve the minutes. A motion. I'll second Joe's motion, this is Brett. Okay. All right, thank you, Joe and Brett. All in favor? Just put your hand up. Yep. Any opposed? And two abstentions, Andrew and Jewel, because they weren't here for the last meeting. <laughs> okay, terrific. All right, so why don't we have um, Jewel and Andrew introduce themselves, and then we'll get into the subcommittee reports. Jewel, why don't you go first? Tell us a little bit about yourself and and what you uh, hope to bring to the committee and get out of it. Hi everyone, my name is Jewel. I am a college student in my second year of college. Um, I'm currently pursuing my bachelor's degree in aircraft operation and currently pursuing my student pilots, my private pilot's license. Um, I hope to um, bring awareness to the aviation industry for youth like myself, because going into it, um, I was completely blind. I had to do a lot of research. So um, through this venture, I hope to um, basically bring awareness and make sure that um, youth all around the US and outside of the US as well have access to aviation. Thank you, Joel. Can I, I just want to ask you one question. How did you get interested in aviation? Um, well, when I was on a flight, um, it was to England. Um, on a 737, um, I basically um, looked out like into darkness. It was like completely black. And I was like, there's no way a plane is flying on like nothing. There's like nothing holding this plane up right now. So instead of getting fearful about it, I was like, okay, I want to, like from that moment, I was like, okay, I want to be a pilot. That's, well, that's terrific. Well, thank you very much for volunteering and being part of this group. We're really excited to have you. Thank you. Okay, Andrew. Thank you, Chairman Vivo and everybody uh, once more for allowing uh, uh, or having me here today. Uh, my background currently, I fly for a major U.S. airline uh, based out of Chicago, Illinois. I also do various nonprofit works uh, within the industry, one of which is the National Intercollegi Intercollegiate Flying Association on their board, with that, which works directly with colleges, and then as well as the Airline Pilots Association, which has an education committee outreach program, which has started in the colleges, and over the last, I'd say about four years, we've come to the realization as a committee that well, college is kind of the, the end result. They're already here. We need to go back further. And through, by proxy, I was the one going through a master's program. So I had access to research and I went and found what the current research said about development and how 
when people actually start deciding what they want to do. And much like Jewel just said, it happens way earlier than college. By that point, you've already uh, made that determination. So uh, we had switched our tactic now to pushing back into elementary and middle school where this development actually really occurs and is impactful. So that has been, so that's my interest. It's been my prerogative to figure out how to keep and, and grow this because we know we have the greatest industry we're you know and i'll be partial to that uh, i want everybody to to get involved that can and um removing and finding the ways to remove as many barriers as possible is currently what i hope to help out in any way that i can on this committee so uh thank you very much well terrific thank you so much for for being here we really appreciate it and look forward to both of your contributions to the task force terrific Okay, let's get into it. Um, we're going to start with Yvette, and really, we're just going to get an update um, for where you're at and um, how you're coming along with the draft recommendations. Sure, Sharon. Thank you so much. Happy to do that. Um, before I start, and for Jewel and Andrew, so uh, I chair the Trends Subcommittee, and our subcommittee members are Brett Levanto, Casey Herzberg, Sid Smith. So they're all on today, and I'll definitely look to them to add into our update today. Um, our subject matter experts from the FAA, Jim Brew, and I have to say something about Christina Druett. She just retired from the FAA, <laughs> effective March 24th. So we lost her as a subject matter expert. But um, again, I wanted to just acknowledge her uh, guidance and support along the way these past uh, several months. They've been instrumental in helping guide our subcommittee. So thank you again, Christina, on behalf of the subcommittee. Um, as we've been sort of um, looking at our draft recommendations and trying, like Sharon said, to build the data to support them, Casey did a great job and provided a template for us where we could um, take our recommendation, really drill it down into a specific um, a couple lines, couple sentences, but then provide a little bit more of a supporting statement with at least you know, a paragraph or so and then data. So we have links to uh, research reports um, and obviously the surveys we've conducted, which again, for the new members background, we did a program survey, a sort of youth survey, trying to survey those uh, young people that were already in aviation. You know, why the question that Sharon asked Jewel, you know, what got you into aviation is we're really the key question and really at what age. Uh, so all that um, data and uh, will be provided to Sharon as she looks to, um, you know, kind of put some meat into the report. We're um, also providing some implementation recommendations, options for how to implement, because as we've seen in the Women's Board Report too, it's not just the FAA, it's industry, it's potentially Congress, it's nonprofits. And really, it's those connections and collaboration that I think is going to be um, the most, we're going to get the most success out of the recommendations that uh, really cross all over all of those entities. Uh, so maybe now I'll stop there. Um, I did want to touch on a little bit of one of the recommendations in the Women's Board Report, as we saw, certainly in their recruitment section, um, specifically recommendations, I believe it was around 15 to 18, some duplication. And, and really, it's a good thing because we can uh, kind of piggyback on what they have and further support uh, those recommendations. So maybe at this point, if I can turn it to any of my subcommittee members that might want to say a few words. Uh, first of all, I just want to say to Jewel and Andrew, welcome and so excited to have you with us on this task force. Um, Yvette laid it out perfectly. Um, I just want to say I feel really good about how deep we dug to make sure we really tied back to the charge of our subcommittee and aligned to the goals of the task force in general. We went through each recommendation after we had everything laid out and organized and went back and made sure we answered those questions on diversity and encouragement. Um, we have a little more work to do in organizing our survey results and highlighting our data and getting that organized for Sharon. And I believe there'll be a shared drive or something coming that we'll be able to throw all that up to. But um, it's just been such a pleasure to work with this task force. I think we, we did a great job. Any difficulties, uh, Yvette, any of the committee members in terms of, you know, things that you need help or support from any of the subcommittees or me? Um, yeah, I don't know, Sid, did you wanna say something? I saw your mic go off. 
before I answer that. No, oh, I just wanted to chime in and say welcome to Jewel and Andrew, mm -hmm. as well as how exciting it's actually been to go back and reflect on all of the work and the information. And I can say in being in education, just looking at the data, I am really excited because I know that the data is also showing that the kids are ready. We just have to make sure we provide those opportunities so that they can be exposed. And it's going to be so important that we all collaborate um, so that there is that pipeline and cre create it. Um, also want to say, as I continue to talk with educators and with teachers, uh, that is so important that we keep in mind whatever we're doing, that we are making it um, easy for educators to implement. Uh, teachers definitely have a great demand on what they're doing, and every day is quite busy, but they are so open to uh, implementing and trying something different with students. But again, we have to make sure that it is clear for them and easy for them to be able to implement. That's a great reminder, Sid. That is a really great reminder because we know how mysterious <laughs> we, we can seem and um, and we need to be cognizant of all the other demands that are on teachers um, and that they don't have um, endless amounts of time and that we have to get them um, something they can just sort of plug and play. So terrific. Thank you. Those great words, Sid. Yeah, we appreciate Sid's uh, perspective so much on our subcommittee as the educator, uh, because we're, you know, predominantly in aviation and talking to ourselves, but we <laughs> need to think about the perspective um, from those that really have firsthand, uh, you know, um, can really touch students firsthand. And that's what a lot of our recommendations focus on is that ability to influence um, young minds. Um, and really domino effect of that. So, um, and that actually is a good segue into the recommendation of the Women's Board report that I just wanted to highlight, which it was recommendation 17, where they talked about train the teacher concept or train the um, those like teachers, they kind of expanded it to counselors, et cetera. So again, it's, it's another, you know, kind of a professional development program where it's encouraging um, not just, um, you know, the FAA, but industry and others to sort of reach out to that um, aspect. And I think that's going to be the key for sure. But Sharon, you asked a question about um, what, what we might need. And Casey touched on this. Um, because our survey results are so broad and contain both quantitative and some qualitative, because we did some interviews. Uh, so we kind of just put that in an Excel spreadsheet. So it was just um, that raw data we want to make that easy for you to digest and we'll be citing specific um, results to support our recommendations, but I know you'll probably want the raw data and maybe some mm -hmm. of the other subcommittees would want to have the results to maybe look at their recommendations. So I think setting up some kind of share drive to be able to put that in um, and also maybe some guidance from you on how you see the theme of this report coming out. I think we talked about it before. Is it mm -hmm. going to be like more of a research, a narrative? Like how can we better support you? Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk more about that when all the subcommittees are um, have reported out. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean we I can certainly work um, with Angela to fit in whatever the guidelines are in terms of the shared drive um, and something that everybody can access. So um, I'll be back to everybody in email about that. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for trends? Easy group today. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Whitney, thank you so much. Um, and take us through awareness building. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd also like to say welcome to Andrew and Jewel. It's nice to have you on um, this task force. I am representing the Awareness Building Subcommittee, and I think I am the only member of my subcommittee on the, the meeting today. So um, I'll do my best to try to update kind of where we're at. Uh, we've continued to attempt to have weekly meetings. Sometimes it has been difficult uh, with schedules of everyone, but um, we're still in touch with each other. We did complete our survey 
um, to the guidance counselor group. We utilize the Association for Career and Technical Education, the A ACTE group, to distribute. Um, they put it out about four weeks ago. We left it open for three weeks with all of those um, individuals that they, they distributed to. Uh, we have not had a very good response, to be honest. Uh, looking at it this morning, we've got about 46 responses, of which 70% um, of those are showing high school guidance counselors, 11% showing middle school, and then uh, additional 20% are not working in um, K through 12 education, so they would be more of the technical field. So uh, we've decided, uh, and with some help from Sharon, to leave the survey open for at least another week. She has some people she's gonna to distribute to. So if anybody on the task force also has um, some parties or individuals they would like to distribute the survey to for the next week, we really appreciate it. Uh, but whatever data we get back from the survey, we're gonna compile and then of course put into um, the template for the, the recommendations. So we wanna back up uh, our recommendations from the subcommittee with, with some of the data from the survey. Also, um, we as a subcommittee would still like to try to have a couple of focus groups, maybe try to get some parents. Uh, we, have, we haven't really um, done that yet, but after we get the data from, from the survey, I would really like to focus on having a couple of uh, meetings with some individuals, focus groups, uh, students and parents to, to get some data from them. So that's kind of where we're at as an awareness building subcommittee. Um, we have our recommendations kind of lined up. We just need some supporting data um, to, to submit with those. So anybody have any questions on where we're at? Thank you, Whitney. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I have, um, I have a group of 45 guidance counselors on campus today for lunch and basically not going to let them eat unless they fill out the survey. So <laughs> um, would be awesome if we could get to 100. That would be great. So if, if folks have ideas about how to do that, that would be terrific. Um, Joe, could I could I lean on you a little since I know you're in that Facebook group with the parents or you at least watch, at least watch it. If maybe you could help um, the awareness building subcommittee you know, put yeah. out the call to some, Ryan and I had a great conversation the other day about seeing if we couldn't try to tackle the, the parent piece. I do think it's a, it's a place that there hasn't been a lot of time spent on. And, you know, we want to expand that to be parents and caregivers. But if, if you could help with that, I would really appreciate it. Thanks for asking. I'd, I'd love to. And I want to, uh, I know Whitney is a member of that group and a number of others. What's, what's really interesting is uh, the Raising Innovation Teens Facebook group has climbed to 4,500 members, um, mm -hmm. which is a huge jump from where they were a year ago. I don't know if we've been helping bring visibility to that group, <laughs> um, but they even added two more administrators, volunteer administrators to help manage the content. And um, it's, it's really intriguing to see the caregiver interest in helping their, their young potential aviators, aviation professionals um, be guided into some career paths. So I think there's great potential there. Oh, terrific. there definitely is a lot of potential. I, um, Yvette had um, put me in contact with a friend of hers whose whose child is looking to get into aviation um, and looking at universities. And and I, I spoke with her yesterday on the phone. And um, you know, she is even in the industry, or her husband is, and um, they are still even at a loss. And they're on, you know, they're kind of in the industry. I have friends that are in the industry, but still very much kind of. Um, feeling their way through it. So I know that that is a very large untapped resource that um, that I definitely would would really like to get in. And I am on that that Facebook group also. So so Joe, I would appreciate any help um, if we can kind of kind of get some of those people and get some information from them. Yeah, terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, Whitney, if you could resend that link out, um, you know, Choose Aerospace, which I'm the president of, um, we've been doing and getting in front of tons of high schools around this aviation maintenance curriculum. And I'm thinking that, you know, the, you know, the executive director of Choose Aerospace could really send that out to these, these high schools, you know, requesting 
uh, on your behalf. You know, it's not a guarantee, but I, I sure would like to help if I can, um, because I, I think we've probably been in front of 100 plus high schools uh, through Choose Aerospace over the last month um, as we push to start this curriculum in the fall. Uh, out of the pilot. So definitely, definitely would be willing to do that and see if we can get additional information, um, you know, for you. Absolutely. Um, I will send that out to the whole task force so that you guys can distribute as, as needed or take it yourself if you would like to. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Thank you, Whitney. Um, I was wondering, have we approached um, ASCA about this? I apologize. It's probably an ignorance piece on my part because I'm, I'm new, but um, I think maybe the American School Counselors Association might be able to facilitate that, but I don't know if that's within their guidelines. So, you know, we did, um, we tried, on my subcommittee, none of us are in, in the education field. So we, none of us had a, had a real contact. We did meet with Sid uh, in the formation of the survey to go over our questions, and she did provide um, the sub, our subcommittee chair, who's not on here right now, Joey, um, so, uh, uh, some contacts out there. We did not, I don't know if it was that specific group, but it was a very large group of counselor, like an association uh, for counselors. And we did not get anything or hear anything back from them. Um, so uh, any contacts that you guys may have at large count, guidance counselor groups would be more than welcome. We would love to have it because we just have really kind of hit a dead end in the fact that none of us are associated in education and it's been difficult. I'd be happy to to uh, to connect with you after this to, to get you guys connected with that because the uh, my sister is a counselor so and actually ASCA themselves has had an aviation row at their conferences for the last few years so ASCA is very interested in aviation it's become a very hot topic for them so um, yeah if, if you don't mind we can connect later. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we did find that there was a couple or one big, uh, large um, convention that was going to occur. And, and we had really thought about trying to get in front of them. But, you know, some of it is cost. They want they want money to donate to their organization in order to get a list of people. And so that that has kind of been a barrier for us also. Thank you, Andrew. That's terrific. Somebody put their hand down. Sid, did you have your hand up? Oh, there you go. Um, I did, but uh, Andrew uh, uh, definitely responded as far as ASCA. Uh, it is a great organization. I, too, have reached out uh, to people who I know in the ASCA organization without any response. Um, so hopefully Andrew can get us connected with the group. But it is a great organization. And uh, during their conferences, they are always open and looking for uh, new programs. So I really think if we can get connected with ASCA, it would be great. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. Anything else, Whitney? I appreciate you telling the group about where you could use some help. So um, if anybody thinks of any additional supports that you can give, both in terms of the the caregivers um, outreach, as well as the guidance counselors, please, please, please reach out to Whitney. Yes, thank you very much, guys. Yeah, terrific. Okay, up next, Ralph and the funding subcommittee. I think Ralph's trying to pull up his presentation. There we go. Ralph, we can't hear you if you're speaking. I unmuted myself, and now I think it's probably easier to hear me. Okay, we're the funding subcommittee, and and oops, and. Uh, I'm the chair, as uh, for those of you who are new, for uh, Andrew and Jewel, uh, and uh, welcome again uh, to, to, both, uh, to both of you. So uh, I'm the chair of the funding subcommittee. We have uh, Tamara Holmes, John Huff, David Purser, who are the official task force uh, subcommittee members. We've also had Joni Christian and Michelle Christensen from the FAA 
uh, work with us on a continuing basis and they've helped a lot in terms of providing advice and, and, uh, and help with a variety of other tasks. Uh, we've done a lot of work. Our sun subcommittee process uh, is as follows. This is the kind of thing we've done over the uh, last, uh, what, 13, 14, 15 months that we've been working. We conducted an extensive review and analysis of the literature. We reviewed 40 years of government and private workforce reports. We researched and analyzed existing funding sources such as government, corporations, foundations, trusts, individuals, and fees. Uh, we developed initially three draft re recommendations. Uh, we received uh, feedback from key stakeholder groups using structured interviews. Uh, and the stakeholder groups included commercial aviation, aerospace and defense, Congress and education. We received feedback from the task force members also using structured interviews. And we got a lot of really good uh, rich information from all of those people we interviewed. And the draft recommendations were developed to address the workforce issue using the funding strategies based on all of the research that we did. Uh, the next steps that we have, we're modifying the current draft recommendation, first three that we had based on the feedback we got in the interviews. And we're considering additional recommendations based on the feedback we got in the interviews. And then, of course, we're preparing the findings to submit to the task force chair. So with that, I'd like to stop this and stop the screen share and uh, see if the other subcommittee members have other uh, piece of information they'd like to add other color. So Tamara, John, David, any additional thoughts? I would like to add, I think that- the, uh, This is David. I, you know, I wanted to thank the committee members and, okay. Uh, I want to thank the, the committee members. When we sat down with you and interviewed you and those of you helped gel what we were getting from the industry interviews. And so there was a, kind of a method to our madness to get the uh, industry interviews first. But I know you reported information through this committee in previous live meetings um, there were a little a little bit of uh, of pushback sometimes we felt like was on our committee we we really got good information back so thank all of you for participating in that interview and helping us you know arrive at the uh, suggestions that we uh, David, we, we got most of that. You were breaking up quite a bit. I think you thanked the committee members who had contributed to um, the interview process and-, and Yeah, and I apologize. I'm, I'm showing an unstable connection right now. So, so I, I apologize, but yeah, just thank all the committee members for their, their time that they spent one-on-one -on -one with us as we interviewed them. Terrific, thank you. Yeah, John, go ahead. I was just going to say about the same thing. I think that the structured interview process really gave us a lot of great information to consider and add to some of the recommendations we already had. It was very insightful. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our two new task force members. And um, I also want to echo, you know, what my task um, subcommittee uh, partners have have shared uh, the structured interviews specifically with you guys on the task force really helped us um, kind of all get on the same page. I think a lot got lost in the public meetings and then a lot of discussion. And once we had individual conversations, uh, it really, you know, kind of illuminated what we had done our work and research on. And, and there was not one of you guys that didn't say at the end of our meetings, you guys have really did your homework and we think you had the toughest job of all of the committees. And I, I really thank you guys for, uh, for just acknowledging the work that we've done, um, the work that everybody has done and knowing that we, uh, the funding committee, you know, is really critical um, in our recommendations to what I think Whitney said, or even uh, the first presenter said, in funding the whole, ta the, the whole, all of the recommendations um, that are coming from each and each of the other task force um, subcommittees, 
And um, we are really putting together, Sharon, um, recommendations that, that feed awareness, that feed trends, that feed the pathways, that feed, um, uh, that, that produces more funding than just the original recommendation. So I want you to thank you guys uh, for that. And also, if you are still having ideas and hearing about news, just like we heard about in the president's bill, uh, I know there are several congressmen, especially uh, in here in Illinois, that I put in together legislation. Uh, so if I have some questions, I'll be reaching back to some of you guys uh, with regard to what type of uh, information should be in that policy based on what we're putting forth to the FAA. And um, I think it's really important that we continue to have the conversations amongst each other. But as, you know, Sharon and you guys mentioned, um, this is a moment in history that we can't miss. Um, I just had one person text me that's watching saying we had 800 applicants for 75 spots for our summer camp for aviation mm -hmm. in the New York and D.C. area. Hey, that's, awesome. that's awesome. But they can't take 800. And so if we have 800 kids up in the Maryland and DC area that don't have programming like Aerostar, like Tuskegee Next, like uh, OBAP and ACE camps. Like we really have to figure something out um, uh, to be able to transfer the knowledge to continue to think, to think tanks and share uh, resources to where we know they're needed now. And so, you know, I, I've grown affectionately fond of all of you guys uh, here in, in doing this work. And I really think that that we're going to make history together in, you know, possibly saving, you know, the future of the aviation industry, um, starting um, to Andrew's point and what we all knew from Sharon's original story um, from younger ages. And um, that's the way forward. And that's the way we build a pipeline and create sustainability long term. So but we have to have money to do that. So, again, any recommendations that you guys are hearing or coming up with financial strategies, like anything we're, we're we're also open to um, finalizing recommendations with what Rob said, some new additions. And I'd like to add uh, that we also have been considering diversity in all of our recommendations. So uh, we're very sensitive to the issue that we, we can't get from point A to point B with the white male population alone. We have to include minorities and women in order to be able to get the workforce we need. And so those, those concepts are included in the recommendations that we're working on. Yeah, terrific. Thank you, Ralph. You know, one of the things <clears throat> that occurred to me as we're talking is, you know, we've talked a lot about federal funding, but in your conversations, in your structured interviews, has a, a particular state or states sort of risen to the top in terms of the funding, either for technical training or higher education or aviation specifically, that you might point to to say, Here's a state that we think is really moving in the right direction. I know North Carolina has done quite a bit of work around aerospace specifically. Maybe it's North Carolina. I'm not, you know, presupposing, but it's, you know, we've talked so much about this is not no one entity is going to be able to solve this. It is everybody working together. And so paying for technical training and, and higher education, just as one example, you know, I am fortunate that in New York, the state is very um, generous, um, almost as generous as Pell, right? That's not true for every state. So should we be making a recommendation that encourages states to think about this as their potential opportunity as well? And, you know, and looking at a funding stream, you know, for career and technical education um, that they may not be at yet, right? Or, a, you know, some kind of working dedicated pathway or group that says, you know, we really want to support aviation in our state. Here's the things we're going to do to make sure that that happens. Um, just as a, a thought. It's a great thought. And I actually just saw a story that a friend shared with me who's in construction and engineering about state revenue that was driven from the lottery and uh, different fees. So they built an entirely new high school that is state of the art, um, basically have ambulatory um, uh, training, they have nursing training. The school is built out at like a medical um, facility uh, with, with all types of state-of-the-art uh, equipment and furnishing, and it was all paid for by state revenue. So I'm interested in talking with 
she actually sent pictures of her at that school um, and did a tour uh, there. So I will, I am uh, that she's on my list to find out more about the strategy that they employed uh, to be able to, to get that funding through those resources. Um, again, as you know, state funding is, is political more than anything else. Um, and a lot of state funding still filters, uh, is, is filtered down from federal dollars that's been disseminated uh, for the states to, uh, to disperse throughout their uh, agenda, which is highly politically motivated in a lot of cases. So uh, I'm, I'm committed to looking into that particular instance on how they were able to do it with, with funding that was generated by the state for the state. So you raise, a, you raise an excellent point. And Sharon, uh, we did interview a congresswoman from North Carolina, and uh, she gave us a lot of information about what's going on there. They're yeah. working on combining uh, working with industry, education, and the federal government to uh, really uh, promote uh, aviation in the state. Uh, they have a really good uh, set of people there that are working. Of course, we have our one of our task force members, John Huff, who's also from North Carolina, and uh, uh, he uh, arranged for that uh, congresswoman to be interviewed by our subcommittee. Uh, and John is in that state, so he knows a lot of what's going on in North Carolina. So North Carolina is certainly one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I'd have to, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my home state of Virginia. Uh, we have a lot of stuff going on here in Virginia. Our Senator uh, Tim Kaine is uh, somebody I happen to know and have worked with over the years, is very, very active in workforce uh, and uh, has introduced a lot of legislation uh, supporting workforce issues. So Virginia has a lot of aerospace and defense uh, in the state. Uh, uh, and so uh, uh, I think that Virginia is another good model. We have a lot of people really working hard to bring uh, resources to the state to support aviation and aerospace defense. So those are two there. I know there are a lot of others yeah, in Illinois. In Illinois, also, we do have a lot of um, uh, incentives to create this space. I'm having a lot of conversations. Uh, Congressman Danny Davis actually has an advisory committee on space and aviation, uh, and they're looking to put forth legislation in May, um, policy in May. Um, with the with O'Hare and Midway and SIU and Lewis University, all of the conversations that we're having are trying to figure out ways to um, create pipelines from the school um, into universities and to work in, in innovative ways to pay for that. Uh, Senator Duckworth's office just put out a call uh, for grants that is uh, that are due on April, I believe, the fourth. Um, they invited us to submit uh, funding specifically for the work that we do. Um, and she, as a former AD aviator, um, is, is highly uh, interested. And then I think, you know, Ryan and his team know well that Senator Dick Durbin has always supported um, aviation in the state and fully backed uh, our AAR's um, MRO at Rockford Airport, which was just made the news again last week uh, for air cargo, um, uh, the almost triple in the last year and a half. So the investments, again, are being made statewide. One of the things that you're making me think about, Sharon, is how we can even create a network and a pipeline for how to create those funding sources and then how to disperse them. And uh, we probably, Ralph, can propose, um, you know, not specifically to states, but even in our recommendations of best practice on how to implement state contracting uh, to mimic what we're proposing for federal contracting as a part of supporting aviation and aerospace education. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but the premise for uh, minority and woman-owned business uh, and disadvantaged businesses being able to receive a portion of contracting opportunities in the state and in municipalities can easily translate to education and training dollars uh, if proposed and enacted on by state legislators. So I think that's a that's a really good uh, idea. And I don't know why we hadn't thought of that before, Sharon. So thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I, look, I know our, our report's not going to go to the states, right? But I'm hoping the states look, that everybody looks at it because one of the themes I think that has really come through this is this idea of collaboration and partnership, that if we continue to exist in silos, we're not going to make this sort of national super push and effort and, and result is not going to happen unless we work together. So, terrific. Yeah, 
Yeah, go ahead. Another state that yeah. is really important in aviation is Alaska. A lot of people don't think of it, but, right. but uh, in Alaska, they have more planes than they have cars because there are very few roads in Alaska and everybody gets around from place to place by plane. So uh, many people see aviation. Aviation is the dominant form of transportation in Alaska. It's very different than most other states. Mm -hmm. A lot of private planes. Yeah, Brent. So I don't want to give up my slot in line, but my comments uh, outside of the state by state discussion, there's a lot of great stuff there. So before I go, Ryan, uh, you raised your hand during the state discussion. So if your comment is about that or question is about that, um, I will in this one instance only, Ryan. <laughs> wow. I'm going to take, Brett, I'm going to take full advantage. I cannot believe you, you gave me the microphone. I can't believe it. So, well, I, I was just going to say, I know we've had lots of discussions, you know, I think maybe offline, I don't know how much it's really come up here, but I, I, I think that, you know, when you look at, you know, some of that legislation going through Congress today, the National Center for the Advancement of Aviation, I mean, it's, it's kind of in line to this discussion, right, of, if you look at it, there's 180 organizations that have signed a letter, there's almost 60 House members, there's eight or nine senators signed on. And the idea, right, is, and I think, Sharon, you said it right, in the, this collaborative effort, right, getting and breaking down silos, you know, within the different sectors of aviation and aerospace, I think is, is definitely, you know, worth a discussion. I mean, I literally just came back from Oklahoma. I was walking the halls of their state capitol uh, between the House and Senate, lots of aviation, obviously, also in the state of Oklahoma. And I think it's this collaborative effort that, you know, maybe somehow could be captured, you know, in the funding committee that could direct, you know, a recommendation more towards this collaboration. I know, I know, I know I'm spending also a lot of time with the Department of Labor and now the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, I think most people would have thought labor, but I would have never thought of workforce through HUD, <laughs> but believe it or not, we're having some very interesting conversations around a workforce arm of HUD that is, is very much in line with kind of what Job Corps does uh, in some ways. And I think it just is, uh, I think indicative of the fact that once again, if we can get the, 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 a recommendation maybe towards this interagency, mm -hmm. intergovernmental kind of um, thought where we're, we're more collaborative um, on the federal level down to the state level. Uh, I, I think that's good. And I think once we do that, I think the philanthropic component of this, I know we don't talk about it because we can't always, you know, it's not easy maybe to control somebody's donation. Uh, but I think, you know, when you got your you know, when we got things together in the aerospace industry, it might lend itself to say, listen, look at this amazing work uh, that is happening now to people of color, to women who have traditionally been highly underrepresented in aviation and look at what they're doing now. Uh, as I, I think there's kind of three tiers there that can be looked at through the funding committee. Uh, as just an observation of things that our group has got in, in the expanded pathways, I just, I never would have thought HUD or labor, uh, and, I, and I like the collaborative effort down to the state level. So I'll leave it at that. Terrific. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. And Ryan, you're absolutely right, because we just sealed a, a, a charitable contribution of almost six figures with Chicago Housing Authority and the local initiative for community support, uh, which funds a lot of development projects in Chicago. So um, I would have never thought that we would have been working with CHA um, and sponsored by corporate dollars, um, Foot Locker, who came in and kind of kind of um, uh, underwrote, underwrote that entire uh, project with Chicago Housing Authority. Uh, they are one of the leaders and um, and having access to young people and programming and funding for programming right in um, in their uh, their housing uh, properties. So you're right, you're right on. It's happening, and those are different places that we can start looking to see. Um, but again, that's that's philanthropic dollars, right? That's coming down to do workforce through community engagement. 
Yeah, I mean, anything we can do to tie our arguments or our recommendations to economic mobility is going to make a strong argument for lots of agencies, right? We know the transformative power of aviation to move a family, you know, from the lower 40, I mean, this is my institution, from the lower 40% to the upper 40%. Right. And that is tied to the success that they're able to have in aviation and aerospace. Um, One here. generation. Yep. Yeah. Makes a really powerful argument. OK, Brett. All right. That was time well used. So I feel good about it. Nice job, Brian. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I, I can just on a little bit of a bow there. I mean, I've been we have uh, some strong members on the ARSA side, repair station, parts manufacturing, a lot of other activities in Georgia. And I've been learning a little bit about what's going on in that state. And what's interesting, just to put a button on that statewide discussion, is that the at the state level, the right now, from my perspective at least, the most uh, proactive actors are actually in the Georgia Department of Business Development on workforce stuff, because Georgia, which already has a pretty impressive aviation maintenance manufacturing foothold. Um, sees technical workforce development as a mechanism to drive overall business development in the state. Um, so that's just kind of an, a, 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 another sidelight on the overlap between interest areas and a lot of these support um, activities for technical skills. Uh, the thing I put my hand up for was, so I'll lower mine since I'm speaking now, um, was just to stomp my foot on Pell Grants again. Um, it's a it, it's a little bit outside of my direct knowledge area, but um, Yvette and I were at an ACTE event last week, and um, they uh, the uh, Association for Career Technical Education they gave a lifetime achievement award to Rob Portman uh, from Ohio, and in the process of of pro providing lovely uh, virtual remarks and acceptance, um, he talked about effort with Tim Kaine, Ralph, and also uh, uh, some other members of Congress in terms of making Pell funding, not just increasing the overall size of the Pell pot, but making it available for short-term uh, skills-based uh, certification classes. And I remember when I used to have the opportunity to work a little bit more generally in technical skills development, um, being at a presentation of uh, the National Skills Coalition that did a comparison, basically, if Pell Grant funding, even at funding levels at the time, this was in 17 or 18, if that funding had been available for short-term skill development, it would dwarf the total CTE funding available through Perkins and WIOA just by making that eligibility change. So in terms of getting federal money flowing into skills development resources. And so hearing that and hearing that it, it's called with a fun acronym to spell it out, but the JOBS Act, um, that they're trying to put it on the move to make that change, you know, is something I just want us to be aware of, yeah. primarily because of the legislative activity, which we, call, we can't always control as we know, but also because of that focal point as a reminder that in aviation, there are so many interesting points of entry that can lead to amazing aviation careers that don't start with an FAA certification or license. Yeah. You know, we focus on pilots in maintenance. We focus so much on, you know, certificated mechanics, but there are other pathways in those 50 plus career areas the FAA already recognizes where you can get someone with a great, you know, bit of short-term hands-on skills training get them into pathways where once they're into aviation and if we have that faith that it is such a great you know industry and environment once they're in you know we can grow them into you know really seasoned aviation professionals and that Pell Grant opportunity has some specific money to it so it's exciting but it, it's also kind of a cultural reminder for us about all the different types of opportunity that we can support with a little bit of resource to do so. That's a that's an awesome point, Brett. Ralph, did you have a reaction to that? Uh, I think it's an interesting idea. I'd also like to uh, comment on uh, on Ryan's uh, 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 comments because I think he's uh, right on on target with some of the ideas there. I've noticed that during the course of the research that we've done, 
uh, there are real discrepancies among the federal agencies, particularly in their collection of data. Uh, if you look at the uh, Department of Labor, the National Science Foundation and others that regularly collect and report on data relating to the workforce, uh, they all use different definitions for things like engineering. Then when you talk to the people in industry, they have different definitions still. And so it's really difficult to understand, uh, particularly when you're looking at an area like engineering, a lot of people say aeronautical engineers. And aeronautical engineers are a very specific slice but they don't represent the whole community. It sounds like it does because of the name, but then there are mechanical engineers that do similar work, electrical engineers. And then when you talk to the people in the aerospace and defense industry, they talk about structural engineers and uh, computer or software engineers. And they also talk about systems engineers. And so when you look at the reported data from these various agencies, they don't report common data sources. Or, or titles for these for these categories. And so when you look at the impact on, on the workforce, it's very difficult to track because the agencies all use different definitions for the way they collect the data. That's a big problem. Uh, and uh, there are similar kinds of issues across the board with agencies and how they, and how they uh, work with data. And so uh, another area where we ran into some issues is uh, when you look at, uh, for example, how, many, how, my, how are companies funding aerospace and defense programs? There's no information on that. We, we, there's information on company donations across the board, generally for education. But when you look at the specific area of aerospace, there's no information on how much money is going into aerospace from corporate donations. Another thing that we found a gap in information on was when you, you look at the percentage of corporate dollars going into training in support uh, of uh, aerospace jobs. No information on that. In all of the interviews we had, we had virtually no, no people that could give us any good information on that particular uh, question. So there are a lot of things like that out there that would that really beg the question of a need to collaborate and coordinate, as Sharon, as you were saying, and as Ryan mm -hmm. indicated, that we need to collaborate and coordinate across agencies in order to be able, and, and with companies, in order to be able to really begin to, to have a common voice and a common perspective and a common way of tracking and working with the data that we're trying to impact. Yeah, you're absolutely right. If you, if you don't have the data, it's really hard to, to make a recommendation or to choose a direction or which, you know, that's how we got to where we are. Everybody's trying something because um, we don't necessarily have the data to back up what we're doing. Um, so we throw a lot of stuff at the wall to see what'll stick. Um, yeah, so just to circle back to the Title IV piece again, um, you know, I think this idea of changing the way that we think about how Title IV funds get awarded so that it's not just tied to a complete program, meaning FAA certification, college degree, but um, falls more into this category and um, it, it, you're finding it a lot more in higher education is this idea of micro-credentialing, which is to Brett's point, you know, this idea of, you know, a welding micro-certification or, or, you know, sheet metal uh, micro-credential. Um, and the idea being that we get somebody in the door and on the pathway, and then can that lead to later on having, you know, a lifelong aviation professional. Um, and those needs are going to vary by region of the country, um, by who the industries are that are served by that education, right, all those kind of things. Um, and having that flexibility within Title IV could make a huge difference in the technical skills of this nation. Right, without thinking about it as a whole, you know, whatever it is, 16 month program, three year program, four year program, um, and a way to get somebody in and, and moving. I mean, this, this kind of comes back to the whole apprenticeship piece too, that I know Ryan and his group are looking at as well. And, you know, we're one of the industries that's probably can be some of the most challenged when it comes to apprenticeship, because we tend to think about it as you can't touch anything until you've got your FAA certification, right? right. right? So right. how do we how do we start to think about that in a different way? 
Hey, hey, Sid, can I pull an audible here just quick? Um, Dr. Joel English is on the Expanded Pathways subcommittee, and he's got to leave here in like one minute. And I, I wanted to have him quickly if he needed to say something. <laughs> I, I know Joel likes to say stuff, so I wanted to quickly give him a, a an opportunity. And then and then when he's done, Sid, I'd, I'd like to hear obviously hear your question. So if that works. I appreciate that, Ryan. Hey, you're absolutely right. I love to say stuff. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just had a um, uh, dialogue within our comments, and, and I think you guys are updated on uh, everything we have. So I'm good and I don't need to take any, any more time there. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Sid. Uh, I just wanted to circle back to the comment about uh, housing authority. Cannot believe I didn't think of that. What a great group to collaborate with. I had the privilege of uh, working with uh, Raleigh Housing Authority years ago and uh, implementing uh, after school programs there. Uh, and as we continue as a task force to make it a priority to uh, make sure that we are in, uh, having diversity within the workforce, I think that is such a great place to start and build upon uh, within uh, housing authorities. They are, uh, housing authorities are definitely national, probably in every state. Uh, and so what a great target group when we talk about uh, increasing the numbers of, of um, uh, increasing diversity within aviation. Uh, again, it was an honor for me to work with uh, housing authority years ago. And uh, just uh, had, it was a way to include so many other organizations as well. So I think that's, it would be great uh, to make sure we're collaborating with housing authority across the country. And Sid, I'm, I'm so glad that you, you were able to, that was able to resonate with you because the, the housing authority in Chicago has been incredible. And I didn't realize how much act, direct access they have to youth that the public schools have and even some information that the public schools don't have regarding really the state of these young people's uh, situations and the, the mobility that Sharon was talking about, the, the economic mobility, uh, that is a direct indicator of success when we can now see how many of our students have um, uh, matriculated into um, home ownership and into, um, into you know a different economic status from CHA or the housing authority. And again, I cannot stress enough how much direct access they have to youth, more so than almost any other organization, including girls and boys clubs and Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. I mean, the housing authority, when you come, when you're talking about um, those uh, disenfranchised groups and underrepresented groups uh, and, and low income, that they, they are literally right there in the trenches. You know, Tamara, you reminded me, we talked about this in one of our working group sessions about this idea of wraparound services. So if we were to partner with, say, a housing authority, now you've got health care, child care, tutoring support potentially, right? That you get this, you know, if we just try to think about this as only aviation, I think we're missing out on you know all of the things that we can do to support young people especially those from underserved communities we have to be thinking about this holistically sharon you hit it right on the head and the work oh you can make me cry we've been doing this work for a long time and we were doing social emotional learning before we knew what social emotional learning was. We were doing trauma-based learning before we knew what trauma-based learning was. When African-American males um, get on the flight simulator in Chicago, the number one thing they tell me is that it makes them feel relaxed. You get anybody else on a flight simulator and they think they're gonna die. Like they you're grabbing the thing off the table, like, oh, I don't like you in a chair. It's okay. And these young men get on the flight simulator and it completely takes their brain to another space. And when you talk about mental health, when you talk about healthcare services, when you partner with organizations like Housing Authority, or like Urban League, you have access to these people, but you also don't have to worry about doing and being an expert in all of these other things. I can focus on aviation and aerospace and getting those kids the support that they need. But when they need tutoring and counseling and even through the pandemic, I had students text me like, Ms. Holmes, where can we get food? 
Where's the food bank? This is really, I mean, this is a game changer when we're able to have partnerships that provide those wraparound services that young people need. Um, and that's why after school programs have been so, so, uh, so important. You know, then the after school alliance out in Washington, D.C., which I am a uh, after school ambassador for, just put out the report from the, the new legislation that includes a significant increase in after school funding because mm -hmm. for at risk and truant youth, the hours between three and six is they, they have the highest. Uh, police um, interaction rate and truancy rate. Um, and so it's important that we think outside the box. Uh, these organizations also get funding for services in the community. Who says that aviation programming is not uh, a conduit for violence reduction? I know it is. Mm -hmm. I absolutely know it is because I've seen it. But can I go get violence reduction money? No but I can work with a partner who gets money for violence reduction and for social emotional learning and for workforce development uh, and teen apprenticeship programs. And then I can partner with them to do my part while they do everything else. And, you know, Sid, I don't think this conversation would have came out if you hadn't said what you said. So I appreciate that. And the parent piece as well. I cannot tell you, it's a direct access to parents. Uh, we were always easily able to work with parents as well as it's an opportunity to replicate whatever program you start in one community. It's an opportunity to replicate that as well as work with the school system. Thousand percent correct. Terrific. Yeah, Yvette, go ahead. Where'd you go? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I lowered my hand and then forgot to unmute. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what Brett was saying about um, having the opportunity to hear from the Department of Labor during this ACTE conference. And I think it might be worth inviting um, a representative from DOL to talk about whether it's at a working group session. Um, but anyway, you know, learning about this opportunity, you know, what the Department of Labor's charge is and given this administration's uh, focus on um, good jobs initiative. I mean, specifically those, um, what are those pathways for underserved communities and young people to, you know, bridge that gap and that workforce development piece. And there is so much money out there. Um, now those grant opportunities are short and it's difficult to tap into, but who's to say, like Tamara and Sid were saying, who's to say that aviation can't get a foothold in that door. Uh, so I think it's really worth exploring. And even through um, the infrastructure bill, in terms of um, workforce development, I mean, our economic um, power that aviation has, I don't think we've done enough to really, um, you know, emphasize that um, in groups that are uh, you know, that we haven't reached before. So I just wanted to kind of echo that um, there's that piece there that we should make sure we collaborate with. Yeah, terrific. Thank you, Yvette. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, Yvette, read, you read my mind. I was I was just thinking, Brett, you know, I know I was at the ARSA conference with, with, uh, with Brett in DC, and we had a great resource there from the Department of Labor. So that might be that might be a, a good person that that yeah. might be able to to reach out or, or or John Ladd directly on the you know he heads up all apprenticeships with the Department of Labor or heck maybe Secretary Walsh for all I know uh, but uh, anyway I, I think that you know this collaboration I, I think as we as you know especially su individual subcommittees as we think about those recommendations I think I think we we're hearing this this collaborative word we're interagency interstate <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, I think that needs to be, you know, made sure that it's captured somewhere, um, mm -hmm. in, 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 you know, throughout the various subcommittees mm -hmm. potentially, as well as I, I think funding is, is an easy place to capture it probably. Uh, but it's, um, you know, I, I think to, to Tamara's point and, and Sid, I'm so glad you did bring that up. It's, it's, it's the, it, it's the holistic approach. I think that's the, Sharon, you said it, right? I think that was very, very important. And when I look at things like AAR is doing, um, you know, through South Chicago initiatives, bringing them to Rockford, working with the workforce board in Rockford, that workforce board provides wraparound services to the student, you know, to the student employees. Those services are things that, that are, that are absolutely instrumental 
in in changing a life and and they're and they're there the resources are there we just didn't know you know i think most people just don't know how to tap into them right and so if nothing else you know just understanding what is that methodology that you can do as an employer as 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 an organization to to be able to know those resources and I think it speaks to you know what Expanded Pathways is doing on the the one stop shop, so to speak, where no matter who you are in this pipeline, whether it's a parent, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a counselor, whether it's a student, you know there are resources specific to that individual, uh, and they all go about that decision making in a, in a little bit different way. So I, I think just in, incredible discussion right here. I feel uh, that uh, that definitely needs to be captured in the final report. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, Joe, go ahead. Uh, I, I just wanted to offer thanks for this conversation. This has been a learning opportunity for me, um, just learning more about socio -emotion, imp emotional impact and um, the benefits of wraparound services. I definitely, um, Tamara, thank you for your vulnerability. And, and you've got me thinking in a different way. It's as, as someone who thinks aviation, 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 you have really opened my ears to, there is more outside of aviation that we can connect to still with the same goal of what this task force is. And I hope to spend more time with you and others offline to reconsider or look at through a different, maybe reframe our focus based on this new information. So I just wanted to offer some, some thanks to that. This was a really important conversation. Thank you for, for saying that, Joe. I really appreciate it. I think you said what a lot of us were thinking. So um, yeah, we always have, I mean, I have to say, every time we get together, um, you know, I, I feel like uh, we always make new headway. We always um, break new ground. And we talk about things that are important. And I challenge us to keep doing that um as we move you know through the process um because i think um it's important that we as an industry hear from voices that are different from the ones we have traditionally heard from right if we're going to make real progress um so thank you everybody okay anything else on on funding can i ask one quick question yeah. sorry ralph and team um, are you guys considering more than the three then based on potentially? Yes, yeah, so far we've got 11. <laughs> okay. <laughs> gotcha. All right, Ryan, you're up. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. And great, unbelievable conversation. And uh, um, really, really excited to kind of talk about the work. I know, I think Jim is also on a, on, on a short leash here. <laughs> so, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. I run the, uh, the, obviously the expanded pathway subcommittee. We have an incredible team, but I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Jim because he's got three minutes. So uh, we've got some unique things that I think Jim's right in his, in the, in the area of one of the recommendations around the FAA, the FAA just issued out some pretty interesting news. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Jim real quick here. Thanks, Ryan. I, yeah, I was hoping who was going to tee that up because that is really the, the biggest news to come out of the FAA in my lifetime. I'm going to put it that way. We have a new Part 147 uh, that has been signed. Uh, we have the interim ruling, so we're just waiting for it to go to the registrar. It completely changes 147 education. So it removes a lot of the barriers that we've faced in the past, things like fixed locations and modalities and seat time hours all gone. Mm -hmm. So it is a brand new, happy 147 world right now. And we're, uh, um, all of the educational institutions are scrambling to meet the new uh, law, but it's also very exciting, something we've worked really, really hard for. A lot of folks in this group and uh, you know, our folks at ATEC have worked really hard to make this happen. And it really allows us to make some major changes and it will allow us to do things like teach 147 inside of a high school. So, you know, we talk about reaching out to youth now. Now we can teach AMT classes in a high school. Uh, it's, it's huge. I, I, I am almost at a loss of words. This is so exciting. Uh, this is, it is, it is incredibly, it's incredibly news. And almost really, you know, we didn't know this was coming. Uh, we, I mean, we did, but we didn't, the timing wise. So it really almost changes our recommendations to a little bit. I mean, you know, the stuff we were planning was kind of aligned with what we had, 
going forward with that. But quite honestly, it allows us to do so much more than we could do before. Um, I am so excited about it. Uh, Ryan, you want to tack back on there? I really do have to go, guys. I just he's he's letting us nice and teed it up for me. So not a problem, Jim. I appreciate it and appreciate you and the work that you've done on on our subcommittee uh, in particular. So thanks for that. Um, so our subcommittee, obviously, we're, we're we're all busy, and I think that's a good uh, that's a good thing. So obviously, you had a chance to meet Jim 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 Hall from um, WSU Tech, uh, Dr. Joel English from the Aviation Institute of Maintenance, Joe D'Amato from uh, she's on with us right now, which I'm I think it's just her and I actually, uh, and and Nancy Nancy Hogging from JetBlue, uh, she had to drop off also. Uh, she's going to try to come back here shortly, but. Uh, you know, I think we've we've had a, 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 a incredible discussions around, um, you know, how do we expand the pathways? And when you look at really what has transpired during the time that we've been here, and and I think been a part of the the task force. And from an FAA perspective, uh, we have uh, our resource is is Ed Comir from um, uh, from STEM Abset. And, and when you think about the work that has transpired in that department alone, uh, you know, they went from one person to now all nine regions are covered. And, and I think that, you know, a lot of what they are doing is, is this collaborative effort in each region. Um, and so Ed and I were talking as the meeting was going on, and, and they do some already tremendous work with HUD as well through some some efforts through STEM Avset. And I, I think it just shows that, um, you know, bringing this, this the, the, you know, the collaboration together, I think we're gonna have, a, you know, a much, much greater impact. I think, you know, as we look at our recommendations and I'll, I'm gonna turn this over to Joe uh, here in just a second, you know, we, you know, making sure that we have that data behind it. I, I think Sharon and I had a great conversation, you know, leading into this one about, you know, I think, you know, anecdotally, we, we have, um, you know, I, I've, I've witnessed and experienced a lot of things in, in, the, in the pipeline um, um, of getting people into an aviation career, whether it's at my current role, or whether it was when I was a president of a college, or even before that. And so, but, but I think the data sets and I, I think, you know, Whitney, I'd like to do, and, and I know I'd like to do some work with your group again, and, and we've been getting some of that data from your group. And I know Joe, we had, hadn't had a chance to talk, but definitely this Facebook group, I think has unique opportunities in front of parents. We've always said, you know, from the very beginning of our workforce, uh, our, our, our tasking in the expanded pathways, the parents were, were critical. And I think getting some of those data points uh, kind of shored up uh, over the next, uh, you know, over the next weeks and, and or so, I think would be very, very helpful for us as we, as we, as we, you know, tailor the recommendations. I think we've also had some some unique and 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 I got to thank Arsa and Brett for you know getting Department of Labor out 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 to the meeting. Um, you know I think there's you know one of the things that we were tasked with in particular was was this apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship model, and we're actually going, you know, um, you know going after some of this Department of Labor activity because historically again aviation has not done this. I mean, if you look at the number of apprenticeship programs that are in aviation companies, it is very, very, very few. Now, my company, AAR, we 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 just we're new, right? So we just went. We we've gotten approval, we've gotten VA approval, we've done that, but we're relatively new to the game, and and I think that what what I what one of the recommendations that will come out of expanded pathways is is truly this unique and incredible and I would almost say untapped resource through the Department of Labor that uh, that aviation and aerospace companies I think have not used and, and I think will use uh, in the very near future future as we push this recommendation. So I think one of the big ones for us in our group and a lot of discussion with Joe and Nancy, and we actually created a sub subcommittee uh, on this activity because we feel that it's so important. And so I'll, I'll kind of turn it over to Joe and, and, and she and, and, and Nancy and Ralph have, have done tremendous work. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and stop talking and turn it over to you, Joe. 
Thanks, Ryan. Ryan and I both love to talk, so um, we'll, we'll try to use our, our time well. Um, but and we're the only two here right now from our subcommittee. But um, what a what a great group! And also, um, Jewel and Andrew, welcome to both of you. You're joining an outstanding group of individuals, so we're happy you're here. Um, so I, I just have to say first, sometimes these days I'm trying to figure out which hat I'm wearing. So you know, I've been doing workforce uh, development for NBA for a while now. Um, proud member of, of Women in Aviation and just back fresh from their conference and excited about what we're going to talk about with the, the advisory board recommendations. And then, you know, as you talked about, uh, Sharon and Ryan, you know, I'm in this Raising Aviation Teens Facebook group because I'm raising aviation teens. So, you know, I want to go across countries on the weekends getting ready to, um, to, to start a collegiate aviation program in the fall. And another who's in a CTE high school here locally um, for automotive technology and asking me how that can translate to aviation. So I will be the first to admit, depending which hat, I don't have all the answers, even with the secret handshake of I'm in the industry. And, um, and, I, and I appreciate that. And I know there's a number of people here who, who juggle all, all those same hats, and which ones are we wearing? And um, the one-stop shop is, is so important to us. Um, what we've been working on with, uh, with Nancy and Rao, trying to understand if there was a place for the parents, the caregivers, the guardians, the counselors, the educators, um, those industry professionals who have half the answer, but, but need to understand how to really get you where you need to go and the access to the resources. It's great to spark the interest, but then there's the action and the barriers to action. And so um, I think we've, we've talked a lot about what our, our draft recommendations are working towards. Refinement, um, probably a few areas. I think our subcommittee, um, Ryan, I'm speaking without talking to you now. I think we'd love to dig into the Women in Aviation Advisory Board recommendations and see where are the matches that exist with expanded pathways is one example. Um, they did recommend a virtual resource center and, and actually use the one-stop shop um, that we've been using, which is excellent. And I know that's because they have awareness that, that that's how we've been talking about it. Um, the advisory board and the task force did a co-presentation at the we talked about the one-stop shop and, and got some good audience questions um, that, that asked to drill down on it a, a little bit more and some educators in the room wanted a, a good understanding of how this could help them. Um, and then also um, just trying to understand those points that are similarities in the advisory board recommendation that had to do with the importance of, of culture, all three steps, attraction, retention, and advancement, and the data piece that goes with it. So um, the one would be to, to try to see where what we can learn from that report and where we have synergy, which they recognized as well. And I think the second one Nancy and I have been chatting during this call and um, would be great to, to probably talk to some students now that we have a, an idea of what this one-stop shop could look like and have them tell us what we missed. Where, where are the holes or, or where can we shore things up? Well, it just so happens we have a student on the group now and I'm, yes. sure, I'm sure Jewel can, well, that, that might yeah. be a great task for Jewel is to put together a small group of um, of fellow aviation students, um, you know, and talk to them and test it out. Okay, yeah, I will connect. Well, you've got Jules' email address in from what I sent the other day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you Jules, if you around. like being voluntold, we we would love to work with her. That would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, terrific. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe. And I I think that's that's most of our update. Um, okay. You know, just 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 really honing in on uh, apprenticeships, honing in on just kind of making sure the data, there's data points behind each recommendation. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and obviously the work that, that Joe and Nancy have been doing on the one-stop shop, I think is, is, is crucial um, as, as, as we look to kind of complete the work in the expanded pathways uh, subcommittee. So I'll turn it back over to you, Sharon. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else have any questions for expanded pathways? Okay, terrific. Well, that was a great segue, Joe, lead in for the talking about the Women in Aviation Board um, report. Again, congratulations to them for finishing. You know, I will I will just remind everybody they have 10 more people than we do, <laughs> and they've got about six months on us. So <laughs> be patient. Um, you know, we are we are working towards um, finishing 
Um, but I, I would be, um, I couldn't nail it down at the moment. Um, you know, we have kind of, um, I've kind of moved deadlines around, um, and, uh, I'm going to have to continue to be flexible, um, especially as I know all of you are working so hard with all the hats that you wear. So, um, I'll, I'll keep the steering, uh, the, um, subcommittee chairs informed, um, as to where we're going to need to be in terms of the deadline for the uh, for the recommendations, it is coming closer. Let's put it that way. But I realize there's still some data gathering that we want to we want to do, and I don't I don't want to I don't want to stop that process because I think that's what's going to make for a really powerful report. So, um, yeah. So in terms of the women's board, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the structure of the report and maybe some things that you liked about it. I mean, the report only came out on Tuesday, so I'm not asking anybody to say they've digested it and um, I like recommendation number 32 or those kind of things. At this point, let's just talk sort of, you know, in broad terms. Um, you know, they, they outlined the problem. They proposed solutions broken down by agency that would recommend or that would make, um, that would take the recommendation and, and potentially could act upon it. Um, I particularly like the two graphics. Um, the um, the barriers and the accelerants, right? What are the common barriers, and then what are the accelerants that could get us there, where we want to be? I because I like the visual. That was part of it too. Um, and then they they referenced it sort of throughout the report. Um, I would encourage you as you're working through your draft recommendations to have somebody think about what are the visuals that might make this powerful as well. I'm not saying you have to design it. Um, but if there's something that you think um, really outlines your solution or the problem, either one, in a really nice visual way, um, you know, feel free to, to think about that in your subcommittees and, and maybe we can talk about that more as well. Um, certainly when it comes to putting the whole report together, um, I might see it too on a macro level. Um, so I know Jewel popped off, but for Andrew's um, information, the plan is to have the subcommittee recommendate draft recommendations come to me, and then I crazily said I would write <laughs> the draft of the report because um, I think it needs one voice and it needs somebody who's a little distant from the process. I mean. I'm not that distant from the process, but I'm I'm a little bit away from your individual subcommittees. Um, so, and then of course you're good, we're going to work through that together as a group. It's not my mine, and it's done. Um, there'll be a couple of iterations. Um, you know, I'll start with the subcommittee chairs, and then the whole group will will have an opportunity to weigh in. Um, but you know, what are other things that you particularly liked, or or ideas that you had as a result of kind of looking at the structure of the, the women's board report? Yeah, go ahead, Ralph. <clears throat> well, like you, Sharon, I like the uh, the fact that they had it organized based on the uh, recipient or the user of a particular recommendation. I saw it done two ways when I watched it. Uh, watched the women's board uh, last public meeting. They used color coding to um, uh, indicate which group the recommendation was for. In the report, they did they dropped the color coding, which I liked, and they they just had a list uh, that was categorized by the user groups. But I thought it was very effective. I think that's going to be really important because it makes it easier for the user groups to be able to identify what really is for me. So if you're in industry, I don't really care about the Congress or the schools. I want to know what do I need to do. Or vice versa, if I'm in education, I want to know what educators need to do. So it, it makes it easier rather than looking through the whole report and trying to figure out which recommendations are for me. I think that's really a helpful tool. Uh, and I think the other thing we need to think about is uh, they also had some background information that was very, very good. A lot of graphics, uh, beautiful pictures of a lot of the women that were historical in, uh, in uh, the women's world of aviation. I think those graphics were really amazing. They did a great job with that. They also, I, I, the whole structure of the report, I seem, I think, seemed to work pretty well. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Anybody else? Yeah, you bet. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely um, sort of uh, targeted the recruitment because of our charge of our trend subcommittee, you know, what are those factors that encourage or discourage youth from pursuing aviation? But personally, I was more drawn to the culture um, part of the report because that's just such a big piece. Um, it's not really necessarily part of our youth task force, but in terms of women um, entering the workforce and advancing and being retained in the workforce, um, that culture piece is such an important uh, conversation. So I thought just kind of my thought generally it doesn't really help <laughs> our No, that's okay. I mean I'll go yeah. back and pay attention to that part when I when I read it. Yeah, thank you. Um yeah and and like we have said all along and I'll just reiterate this is I think any place that we are mirroring their recommendations, <clears throat> it's a reinforcement to all of those groups that we're trying to talk to that, you know, two independent groups found the same thing, right? So I think, I don't think it, it's, um, I hope they don't take it that way. <laughs> I, I see it as, as um, complimentary for sure. Um, so. You know, one of the things that I, that I see, that I see in a report and that, that kind of hit me um, is the, the, are the, the the graphics for the ages, um, pilot ages by women and men. Um, I think we have we have a different issue than they have, but it's still around um, matriculation and persistence. Only ours is from a young age. We know that we have to start earlier and get young people into careers in aviation. And diverse groups are probably going to fall off. And it's kind of one of the reasons why I kind of hate that we didn't look at diversity, equity, and inclusion as a separate entity instead of it being built within each one of the women and and uh, the youth task force. But I believe if we had these numbers extrapolated into the future, you would see just as women diminish in age and and persistency throughout their career, so do minorities. Um, I believe the number goes down significantly um, throughout their careers, but. Women, the women's board have a uh, has a double whammy because it's a double minority, right? So you have um, you. It shows that they really need to get more women into the industry, but it also shows they really have to keep more women in the industry long term. Yeah. And the women's number and age uh, dropped off significantly um, after. I mean, the the majority of them between twenty and thirty years old. Um, and after that, they basically disappear from from the cockpit. And that's something that we have to look at from a reverse angle of getting young people into the aviation field a lot earlier. But how do we get minorities to persist um, in aviation long term? And what are those? Uh, what are the things? And when I say minorities, I'm also including women. Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that we need to think about to keep them working in the industry? uh consistently uh and longer uh, because the numbers show that you know the men's they work their entire career you know as pilots and the women just they disappear if you if you guys are looking for the graphic it's page 27 um but i think there's a lot of weight uh in this particular uh graphic and i think it lends itself to uh a dual conversation about um not just uh exposure and um matriculation into the industry, but persistence and having success in the industry. And we haven't even begun to talk about management, uh, who are the decision makers uh, mm -hmm. and the gatekeepers of what the future of the industry is going to look like. And that's almost 99% uh, white male in the aviation sector. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we absolutely can do as part of this, Tamara, is, um, is you know, make recommendations for further work. So like you, I sort of felt like as I was reading through, particularly the recommendations around advisory groups and data collection, and I thought, oh, you know, it'd be so nice if that included underrepresented populations and, um, you know, beyond women, right? Um, so absolutely one of the things that we can recommend is, you know, look, we think these recommendations for further work to get women into the managerial and C-suite levels equally applies to underrepresented populations and can that's right and that conversation to make sure everybody's included in that tracking and effort and you know 
Yeah, so we can definitely do that. Even though we weren't, it wasn't our charge, we can say, hey, (laughs) you didn't ask us to think about this, but we did. And, you know, this is for another group potentially to think about, but you should at least consider making the umbrella wider. And it's a, it's a, when, what, and we knew that this would happen, right? The more work you do, the more work you create for yourself. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's the dichotomy of, of doing work and being successful at what you do. And I think the success of their work has absolutely highlighted uh, some pain points for the industry, um, right. particularly around leadership, management, and persistence in underrepresented uh, groups. And this is not a secret. I just think that I don't think, when people look at the slide about age demographics, they, I couldn't be the only one that have seen that, you know, at first glance, but it's not put out there specifically as the loss of women in leadership, the loss of women in long-term uh, as mentors, as advisors, as, as visionaries, um, they're gone by 40 years old, <laughs> like they're gone from the industry and the guys are there for another 20, 20 years, 25 years. And those guys, because of the seniority, get leadership positions and they they shape the future of the company. And right. so if we don't keep women in the workplace longer, uh, then we don't keep women, we don't get women as managerial and executive candidates. Right. And that's the same for underrepresented population, underrepresented populations. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, Sorry, this, this iPad always have to see me pointing at the buttons here. Mm-hmm. Um, I really, really like this discussion and I wanted to, um, to highlight, well, what we all know, but then when I saw in the report, you know, attraction is one thing, but we have not done a good job if we haven't figured out how to retain them. And I, and I know we're supposed to attract youth in this case to, to aviation jobs, but it doesn't help us if it's a revolving door. Mm-hmm. Um, I really appreciate that the advisory board talked about mental health issues, psychological safety and um, employee resource groups, or as, as I think of them, um, ally groups, that makes the, the support network stickiness, I think that allow an individual to stay in this industry because they have a, a peer support network, mm-hmm. um, the culture piece, they work in an environment that feels, uh, that they know is psychologically safe. And, um, and that leads to the operation safety um, it leads to the success of, of the organization and, and their bottom line. And so, so, so better financials as well, but that they explicitly talked about that in one of their recommendations, I think is a really important intersect. And um, our, our one-stop shop does talk about connecting um, an individual through the virtual guidance counselor to ally groups that they may not be aware of, um, whether they're national or regional. So in addition to getting the information they need about a certain career, and resources to pursue that career, they also may gain um, a peer network or a mentor network from it. Yeah, terrific. That's great. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, I was just going to say I thought I, I haven't I haven't had the time to read the whole thing in 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 so I just want to I just want to say that, but I I think what comes out of it is the passion right of of this group of the of the women who are part of that group and the work that they've done. Um, and, and, and the work that they've done in the industry already, you know, in making this, you know, making this a, a full, a full change and being deliberate about how we go about making sure that, you know, as Tamara said, that it's not just getting them in the door, it's retaining them. And I think that page 27 is a really good example of, of why we're experiencing what we're experiencing. But I, I, you know, Becky Ludi, who I, who did my research project with cohort hiring of female technicians in Miami, you know, some of this data was given to me because it was, it was crossover data in a project that we were doing there. And it was very, very, you know, very, very interesting what we've learned as a company. And I think companies at the highest levels need to take a look at this report and really examine what, what, what do we do today? Uh, What are our policies? What are our, um, you know, how can we, you know, uh, not just attract and, and get people in the door, but how do we retain them? What are those policies we have as a company that, that help, that help females, especially young mothers and mothers that are, you know, that are, that are, that are having kids that, you know, that's where that starts to happen, but, and, and then we lose them. And so I think there's an opportunity for us. And I think AAR through the work that we did, uh, you know, we've learned a lot 
just by doing a, a small cohort project. And we're, we're looking through the Lumina Foundation, hopefully in the future to do uh, kind of four projects all at the same time is what our hope is in all four repair stations at the same time. Uh, but I, I definitely, I, I definitely applaud the uh, the women for the, the the report. It is incredible uh, the the passion that, that that comes from it, and 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 definitely I've seen uh, quite a bit, or not quite a bit, but a few places of overlap, which I think, uh, as as Joe said, I would agree with wholeheartedly. Uh, it really speaks to the fact that you know two independent groups find find uh, find a similar issue. So that, that, that's my observation and, and just uh, just appreciate their efforts. Great, thank you. Yeah, Ralph. Yeah, I, I agree with what everybody said so far. I think that the, the cultural and structural issues are particularly important. The women's uh, board report focused a lot on the cultural barriers that are that exist for women. And I think they were right on target with everything that they did in that regard. Uh, but there are also structural issues that have to be dealt with as well. Just let me get to give you an example to give you an illustration of what I mean. My own personal research, I focused on, on dealing with, uh, with students that are going through an engineering program to get into the aerospace industry. And what in, one of the uh, things that I found through this research is that very often we get people uh, through the whole process, through the pipeline, and it's not easy. We get them through the high school program, we get them into college, we get their degrees, and then, then at the end, when they graduated and they got a degree in uh, in a in a let's say an engineering of one sort or another and want to go into uh, an aerospace career, they don't because they have big student loans that they have to pay off, and they need to get a job to pay those loans off. So they go with the with the opportunity that they get first, and when they do that, uh, they tend to stay in that particular field. So if they're a mechanical engineer and they wanted to go into aerospace uh, and they end up going into biomedical engineering because they get a, a job offer there, maybe more money, maybe it's easier to get a job in that field, maybe the door is more friendly and open to them, then they go into that field. So at that last moment, we lose a lot of people that we've spent a lot of resources getting through the system. And that's a critical point where, we, where the system fails for us. And uh, there are a number of structural points in the system like that that haven't really been addressed. Uh, and so, for example, let me give you another point. At that point where they're looking for a job, companies like Disney come around and they say, we want to hire you and we have all the glitz. And if you're going to be an AMT, uh, you don't have to be out in the cold and, and, and we'll give you an air conditioned facility. We'll give you all kinds of benefits and we'll give you good pay. Come work for us. And a lot of kids do. So we and you know SpaceX has done the same thing in trying to compete with the larger, more traditional aerospace companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman. They said we'll give you an exciting, flat organization. We'll give you a lot of opportunities to be innovative. And those kinds of things are very attractive to the young people today. We haven't done enough in our industry in terms of paying attention to those cultural and structural issues that keep people out of the industry or pull them away from the industry. Yeah, if you read the um, Aviation Week does an annual um, study on why people leave too, right? That we actually get them in and then they go. <laughs> and it's for the same kind of reasons, right? It's the allure, it's the trappings, it's the, and I don't mean that in a bad way, you know, it's the, um, uh, it's harder. It's hard for us to retain. It is. Um, okay. Yeah, Whitney, go ahead. So I just wanted to kind of further discuss a little bit of the cultural side of the recommendation for the women's group. Um, in meeting with them at the at the Women in Aviation Conference, it was it was a great eye opener uh, just to have a little discussion with them about the cultural aspect, which I think is huge, and we all probably could have identified a lot of that on our own, but uh, being a woman in an operational aspect in the industry, um, I've seen it, but you know, the retention aspect and from our perspective of drawing youth into aviation, but then specifically continuing to retain them through their career. Um, the culture aspect also comes down uh, into our line of work. And I feel like maybe this group hasn't really touched on the cultural aspect of it at all, really. Um, 
but just thinking about, you know, the issues that women have are also some of the same issues that you will see with minorities um, and children coming into, into the field. So, uh, you know, I think that the cultural aspect that they talk about, it really, uh, and I asked them this in the, in the meeting, I said, well, I, I love these these recommendations are amazing, but you can't mandate cultural change. So how do we as task force members or task force groups um, get these reports or recommendations out to the industry, the top level who can make the cultural changes in, in the industry or as employers to retain and to, to keep women and minorities as we bring them into the workforce? I think that is a big question is, of the cultural aspect of this is how do you how do you get the employers to start the change so that we do retain people because just from my perspective as a woman in the operations side being in my mid 40s right now um, I've stayed in my career I love my career but I do see women leaving because they want to have a family or because the cultural change isn't there or because the opportunity to advance through the organization isn't there because I still see white males getting roles that women put in for and they consistently don't get and then they eventually just quit trying. Yeah, it, it's it's making me think about how do we sort of um, think about that aspect of the report and who do we talk to to help inform that piece. I have to think a little bit more about that. Um, I think we have a work, working group session planned for later in April. Um, that might be a good place to, to think about how we, because again, it's not part of our, our charge for sure, but I, I, to everybody's point, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't di discuss it um, and offer some, some thoughts on why we think it's important to think about the whole pathway, not just the attracting them. Piece. So, so let me let me think a little bit more about that. Yeah, Tamara, go ahead. I was just going to say this. This goes right back to the conversations that I had uh, when I spoke at the National Academies um, a couple of weeks ago, and the conversations with ACRP and the Transportation Research Board. Uh, they were the Future of Aviation conference that I spoke at was my panel was specifically focused on 2030 to 2060 and how to get people into jobs and retain them into jobs that we don't even know what they are now and don't even exist now right it's like about like talking about digital music streaming and social media influencers when we were in high school like it didn't exist and so as we move forward in the industry i think um when the recommendations are done we all know that there's more work that can be done and um the trb and acrp have expressed mm -hmm. huge interest in being able to follow up on on our work and um i, I um we did let uh them know that uh that that sharon um uh and that we're we're in agreement that that they should get the recommendations to your point whitney and anybody else and that we need to get these two once they are released and out of our hands um, to start figuring and figuring out uh, how to fund the pipeline, how to streamline processes, what organizations and leaders in industry uh, and philanthropy and workforce development can can help uh, create um, some real scaffolding around these recommendations. And then the areas that we now see need further investigation. Mm -hmm. I think cultural chain ha has to be driven by data. And a lot of times people just call it preference or feelings, but it's not a feeling when the story of white females not advancing is the same story as African-Americans not advancing. It's the exact same story. We get tired of applying for jobs. I left corporate because I knew they would never allow me to be an executive, ever. They had never had an executive a female in the history of the firm in 50 years. And so not that I couldn't have been the first, but did I want to keep fighting that fight and watch people get hired and me get passed up knowing that I was the candidate for the job? No. So I think the area of research has to go beyond feelings, right, Whitney, and kind of document these personal stories that has led to a culture of disenfranchisement. And that it's the same story as 
and I don't want to, you know, belabor the point, but it, it, it wasn't police brutality and the killing of unarmed African Americans wasn't a thing until it started being documented in, and on camera. And we have been saying for generations, the police treat us wrong. This is what happens. Even if we do everything right, we can't win. And that story is perpetuated for underrepresented groups and disenfranchised folks in the corporate workplace. Is it as violence as police brutality? No, but are the effects are the same with um, creating uh, an atmosphere of, of otherism, an atmosphere of you know, self-doubt and um, you know, a, a lack of upward mobility? Absolutely. Is it robbing women and people of color of, of economic standing and stability for their families and for their future? Absolutely. You know how many women executives could have been millionaires and CEOs and, and changed the landscape for their families? They never had those opportunities. And it's always been relegated to feelings, feelings of discrimination. Mm -hmm. Now, that's why people have to file EEOC complaints. And I think once we start to get real numbers and statistics from women and people of color that say, this is what happened to me. This is how it's been documented. Being able to pull EEOC complaints from organizations that are public record um, to be able to, to substantiate the claims for the need for cultural shift. And if we don't do it, um, it, it backed up by data, it's going to be real important. And, and, and if anybody needs homework, you know, uh, Gina Davis did a documentary on, and I don't know if you guys saw it, she literally started to document how female directors in Hollywood were uh, literally blocked from uh, being able to lead and direct uh, movies. And the documentary is incredible. It just came out at the end of last year. And uh, her, she knew that she had to get the numbers. And I think we're in the same predicament. Uh, in order to create cultural shift, we have to be able to have proof positive and that only that doesn't come from testimonials is going to have to come from a, a real digging into the documentation of, um, of it's, it can get ugly. But until we solve these issues, um, you know, we're going to be having another task force in 30 years to figure out how we didn't change this in 2022 and 2025. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good point, Tamara, that idea of, you know, really sort of um, challenging the industry to say who who can, and I when I say industry, I mean really big tent here, right? Anybody that touches um, aviation, um, you know, put your numbers up, right? Be the model, speak to, you know, how your organization is is working towards empowering you know, underrepresented groups. Um, it's a, it's a really, I, I prefer carrot, but it, it sometimes takes stick, <laughs> right? So, but all it, all it's going to take is a few um, to start to do it and then others will follow, right? Because they'll feel the pressure of having to meet that need. Um, yeah, so I, I'll think more about how we tackle this um, as recommendations, but I, I thank you for reminding me, Tamara, that the TRB is very interested in in taking our recommendations and possibly looking at greater research and study, which is terrific. Um, and we can certainly recommend um, some further work that be done. Okay, so another amazing, wonderful meeting. Um, we um, we had not set a definite date for our next public meeting. Um, I will work with Angela and her team to figure out when that makes the most sense. Um, like I said, I believe we have a working group session um, scheduled for sometime in April. Um, I'll go back and double check and make sure. I know we definitely have a steering committee meeting, so meeting with the subs chairs to go over sort of where we're all at um, and driving towards uh, the uh, draft recommendations. So I'll be in touch with uh, with all of you through your chairs um, to figure out when those pieces are due. Okay. Angela, over to you. So um, just want to pick, pick, piggyback on what you just said, Sharon. You all always have such a robust conversation. And um, it's quite clear that as you all meet separately, when you come together, 
everybody is able to feed off of the information and sharing their input and so and their insights. So I think that's really great. Um, just as a reminder for those who are viewing, if you would like to see the meeting materials from today, they are available on our FAA committee website. And if anyone has any comments, please send them to the email address in the Federal Register meeting notice. And with that said, Sharon, you can adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Could I get a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye. Bye. Take care.